Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Musante. Uh, I am the Executive Vice President for the Center for Education Reform. And on behalf of Jeannie Allen, our founder and CEO, and my colleagues at CER, we want to welcome you to Why America Women's Vote at 100 Suffragists in Their Own Words. A uh, couple of quick reminders. Uh, we we uh, appreciate all of you being here today. Please use the Q&A uh, for any questions you might have for these remarkable women that you will be uh, interacting with today. Also, quick reminder, we want to remind you of our Master Teacher Recognition Program, as well as Toward a More Perfect Union, our Student Essay Challenge. Uh, the deadline for that has been expand expanded to March 30th, and uh, we look forward to getting all of those great essays in and hearing from all of you. Uh, we also want to take a quick moment to thank our supporter, the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, for all of their help in bringing all of these wonderful programs to you. And now, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce, once again, from Washington Latin History Department, Washington Latin Public Charter School here in Washington, D.C., uh, Chair of the History Department, Mr. Lawrence Staten. Lawrence, good to see you again, my friend. Likewise, Michael, it's good to be back with you. Uh, it's a uh, pleasure to be with all of you here. Again, it's a pleasure to be with the Center for Education Reform, as well as all of you today as we talk about uh, the women's suffrage movement at 100. Good, let's just get right to it then. We have a panel of very, very special guests today. Uh, the leaders of the suffrage movement. So it is my honor to begin uh, with our first guest, the one and the only Elizabeth Cady Stanton. So Miss Stanton, if you would be so kind. Oh, hello, how are you all today? Yes, I, I am indeed Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And um, I, what my friends call me Lizzie. I was born, raised and very well educated in upstate New York. And um, well, I, I was, when I was about four years old, my mother gave birth to a new child, a sister, a daughter. Now, as my parents only had one son and several daughters already, I remember the grown up standing about the cradle, looking down at the baby and saying, oh, what a pity, she is a girl. Oh, then when I was 11, my older brother, Eliezer died. And I remember so well my father, Judge Daniel Cady, in his morning, he said to me, oh, daughter, I wish you were a boy. And I know my parents loved me and my sisters, but they were keenly aware that the opportunities for girls were unequal to what was available to boys in my day. Now, that same Christmas, I received a lovely coral necklace, and upon showing it to one of the young men of my acquaintance, he said, Oh, Lizzie, if we marry, that shall be mine. I was still young and not fully understanding about how laws worked, but I knew that the laws pertaining to women could be found in my father's law library, in his many books, and that those laws were unfair. I resolved to see this the first opportunity when alone in his office to cut every offensive law pertaining to women out of his books. Yes, literally cut them out. Fortunately for my father's library, my plot was discovered. And before I could achieve my plan, my father explained to 11 year old me how laws are made and that even if his own library should burn to the ground, it would make no difference in the woman's condition. He gave me hope though. He said, Lizzie, when you are grown up and able to prepare a speech, you must go down to Albany and talk to the legislators. If you can persuade them to pass new laws, the old ones will be a dead letter. Now, those early experiences and my willful nature caused me never to accept this status quo for American women. And just as my father suggested, I would grow up tirelessly working to secure for my sex our rights as American citizens. 
Thank you so much, Ms. Stan. It's so good to be with you this afternoon. Before I bring in our second guest, I've just been told that our poll is now ready. So we're going to uh, bring that up. And the question is, what does suffrage mean? And while our audience votes on that, uh, I'm going to introduce our second guest uh, this afternoon, Sojourner Truth. Well, I was born somewhere around 1797, upstate New York, Ulster County, not too far from the Hudson River. We belong to a Dutch family called the Hoddenbergs. They give me the name of Isabel, Isabel Bumphrey. And Bumphrey in Dutch means tall and strong. I grew up tall and strong like my daddy. My daddy's name was James. My mama name was Betsy, we call her Mama Bet. My mama told me I had 10 brothers and sisters, but they were all sold off by the time I knew what's going on. I was the only one left. But during my lifetime, I was sold three times. And after I gained my freedom, moved to New York City, I didn't like the goings on there, so I prayed God to give me guidance. And God said, Belle, be about your father's business. I want you to sojourn the countryside, to speak up for women's rights, to tell women folk they got just as much rights as the men folk. They should be able to work outside the house, earn their own money. They should be able to own property. Be able to speak in public without being ridiculed, be able to vote and run for public office. So when I left New York City, I was on a mission for God. So since God told me to sojourn the countryside, I changed my name. I changed my name to Sojourner. And wherever I go, I would speak the truth from the heart. So my last name should be truth. So from that forward on, I was known as Sojourner Truth, walked up and down the countryside from city to city. Oh, the women started gathering around and started listening to me. They said, that Sojourner is talking in public about women's rights. Oh, they started gathering around. Oh, and I met all the famous women who were already talking about women's suffrage. At first, they didn't invite me to the meeting. They didn't quite know what to expect. But after a while, they started inviting me to the meetings. And of course, it led me down to Washington, D.C., where I went down there to advise President Lincoln what to do with the former slaves down at the Freedmen's Bureau. And then from there, of course, I went up to Ohio to the Women's Rights Convention. So that's what I did throughout my life. So during the countryside, speaking up for women's rights. Thank you so much. Now, uh, suffrage, as you see in our poll, uh, means the right to vote in elections. And well, good job. 80% of our attendees got that correct. Well done. When the Constitution was passed in 1787, only white men were able to vote. But fortunately, the Constitution allows us to move toward a more perfect union because it allows amendments to the Constitution. So the last guest I'm going to introduce is Alice Paul, another one of the suffragists. Ms. Paul, good to see you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'd like you to know that I was born in 1885 into a Quaker family. Now, although I was born in the 1800s, I was not a Victorian. You see, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Victoria believed that she was powerful and independent because of the, the divine accident of birth, the divine right of kings. When I never believed any of those Victorian philosophers who said that women's brains weren't big enough to be as smart as men. As a Quaker, I believe in the inner light, in, in the divine light in all of us, uh, as, as a guiding principle, equality. Because I attended Quaker schools, including Swarthmore College, a Quaker institution, I was very protected. And it was not until I went out into the broader world when I realized how terrible 
the inequality toward women was. And it felt as if I'd been punched in the stomach. I, my deep conviction of the wrongheadedness of that approach and the inequality that I experienced led me to become more active in the women's suffrage movement and to develop strategies to finally win the vote. While studying in England, I was involved in the militant suffrage movement, which advocated civil disobedience on behalf of votes for women. And while in England, I was imprisoned seven times. When I returned to the United States, I was ill, ill from being imprisoned, from hunger striking, and from being fed against my will. But here at home, I earned a PhD and I became active on behalf of a federal woman's suffrage amendment. As founder and head of the National Women's Party, I used the tactic of holding the political party in power, whether Democrat or Republican, responsible for women getting the vote. And if the party did not support women's suffrage, we would work against that party and their candidates. I planned processions and picketing and vigils outside the White House. Nothing like that had been done before. I was arrested and put in prison here in the United States too. But after we finally won the vote for women in 19 and 20, I authored a constitutional amendment that came to be known as the Equal Rights Amendment. I have used all the energies of my lifetime to work for votes for women and to further equality. So, Miss Stanton, so the floor is now yours. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the uh, Seneca Falls Convention and how really the uh, suffrage movement got started. Oh, well, I'd be delighted. Um, Actually, I'm going to take you back to my marriage because that has a lot to do with it. My, my honeymoon, as it were. Um, at the age of 25, I would find myself engaged to an abolitionist and aspiring lawyer, Henry Stanton. Now, as Henry was to participate in the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London that year, oh, it was 18 and 40, as his new wife, I went along for the ride. So our honeymoon would be spent on that voyage to the old country and at the abolitionists convention, the world abolitionist convention, my honeymoon, yes, I know, so romantic. But anyway, the American delegation was a promiscuous one. It included both men and women on the council, but in London, the women were denied their rightful seats and their votes on the convention floor. William Lloyd Garrison, one of the most important American public voices of abolition, was so incensed at the measure that he refused his seat in solidarity with the women. I joined the women and Mr. Garrison in the gallery where we were expected to sit in silence and watch the proceedings. I often found myself seated next to the very formidable Lucretia Mott from Philadelphia. She was arguably one of the most important distaff voices denied her seat and her vote. And we both questioned how this could be called a world's convention when only half of humanity was to be represented there. Mrs. Mott and I resolved to hold a convention of our own as soon as we returned home to America and form a society to advocate for the rights of women. Nothing like this had ever been done before. My immediate years of my marriage and returning from the convention were filled with raising a family. So our women's rights plans for the United States would be put on a simmering pot until I guess 18 and 48. In New York state in April of that year, a married woman's property act was passed. Again, the first of its kind in the country. Now, this largely was a measure sponsored by wealthy fathers to help keep family fortunes that devolved to daughters' dowries out of the hands of profligate sons-in-law. But it was at least a step in the right direction. However, it still did not help wives with the money that they might contribute during their marriage to their households from their work. Yes, more and more women, married women, were working wives and mothers yet laws still put all of a wife's earnings 
into the controlling pockets of husbands. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never met a woman who spent her days weaving or spinning or laundering or baking, or who was happy to turn her meager earnings over to a husband who would gamble and drink away the family living. I mean, do you suppose that any woman is such a pattern of devotion and submission that she willingly stitches all day for the sum of 50 cents that she may enjoy the unspeakable privilege in obedience to men's laws of paying for her husband's tobacco and rum? Anyway, more needed to be done. In July of that same year, 1848, I received word that Mrs. Mott was visiting a mutual friend of ours in Waterloo, New York. Now gathered around Mrs. Rachel Hunt's table, Mrs. Mott, her sister Mar Martha Wright, uh, Marianne McClintock and I decided then and there to call a woman's rights convention. We gave five days notice that the convention would be held in Seneca Falls on July 19th and 20th of that year. Now, the most important thing to come of our convention was a declaration of sentiments and a series of resolutions on the matter of women's equality. Adopting the words of independence from the very famous 1776 Declaration of Thomas Jefferson, I stated in our sentiments, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of men toward woman and having in direct opposition, uh, object rather, the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. We then listed our grievances, including the suppression of women's voting and property rights while governments engaged in taxing us, still while denying us representation. We bemoaned the lack of women's access to better education and profitable employments. We decried that women received unequal wages for equal work, etc., etc. As far as the resolutions of that convention, Curiously enough, one of the greatest debates was about woman suffrage, the vote. If you can imagine, there were those in the convention, highly respected voices, who thought woman suffrage was too much of a political issue to tackle at this moment. A vote was held in the convention and by a very slim margin. Woman suffrage would remain as one of our resolutions Shortly after the 1848 convention, I would meet my greatest partner in the effort, Susan B. Anthony. Now, she'd not been in New York to attend our 48 convention, but two years later, Miss Anthony became an indispensable member to the cause. Together, she and I wrote addresses for temperance, anti-slavery, education and women's rights conventions. Oh, we made it a matter of conscience to accept every invitation to speak on every question in order to maintain a woman's right to do so. Basically, if we didn't show up, our voices wouldn't be heard. So we'd show up and make our voices heard. Now, I speak publicly very often now in my later years, but in those early days, I was still so often shackled to my domestic responsibilities and raising my family. Miss Anthony was a single woman, so she had more latitude to go and speak about the country. I would forge the thunderbolts and Miss Anthony would throw them. And she still solves every difficulty with the refrain, woman suffrage. By May of 1851 at the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio, a new remarkable voice joined our movement when an emancipated woman who called herself Sojourner Truth stepped up to speak and our movement would be moved forward in a momentous way. Miss Truth, would you take the stage? Oh, I'd be glad to. Now, you know, when I went up uh, to Ohio to that women's rights convention, I wasn't invited. I just went up there. And most, most times I wasn't invited, I just showed up. I wanted to see what was going on. So two days convention. So the first day I sat way in the back, listened to everything going on. 
Woe to men saying that women don't need to be equal to a man. They said, Eve by her lonesome managed to turn the world upside down. Woman's not as smart as a man. And I said, if this is a women's rights convention, how come ain't but the men folk doing all the talking? But you see, remember in those days, women barely did some speaking in public. They'll be ridiculed and never seen again. But whatever the good Lord puts on my heart, I'm going to say it regardless. So that first day I left, I went back, came back the second day. Same thing, men folk doing all the talking. So I put my chair a little closer to the front. Oh, I said, I got to get up there. I got to say something. So a couple of benches ahead of me, I saw a couple of women. So I said, psst, 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 psst. Psst, psst. They looked back, they saw me, they said, oh, that's not so the truth. Who invited her? Wherever she goes, she causes trouble. They'll riot, they'll burn this place down. She'll ruin us. Don't let her speak. I can hear them. Don't let her speak. No, no. I said, I just want to say a few words. I won't be long. They said, well, one said, maybe in due time. The other one says, well, we'll see how the program goes and Maybe we'll give her a chance to speak. I said, well, you know, I said to myself, the program might be over and I won't get a chance to speak. I got to speak now. So I said, how am I going to get up there? I'll sing. It was early in the morning. Before I could get another word out, everyone turned and looked at me. They were pointing. That's that sojourner Oh, tools. Mouths were open. A couple of the ladies just fainted on the chair. Oh, I heard all the ruckus. I said, well, while there, everybody in the ruckus in the roar, I stood up and straightened my scarf. And I walked real slowly up to the front. All the way up there, they were pointed. That's such a journey too. When I got up to the front, it was pin quiet. I said, well, there's so much racket. There must be something out of kilter here. Now I look around, I see all the books and flags and paper and such. I can't read a word in them, but I can read the people you see. Seems to me you men folk arguing about something the women folk already got. And that's freedom and equality. No one in this here room come out the mother's womb bound and shackled. We was all born free. So this freedom you're talking about is something man made up, not God. Now, that gentleman over there in the black hat said that Eve by her lonesome managed to turn the world upside down. I say to all the women folk in here and all the women folk all over, shouldn't we be able to turn the world right side up again? Or oh, the woman gave up, they got up and they started to applaud, but the men folk look at them so mean, they sat back down. I said, oh, I must be on to something now. And I said, that other gentleman over there said, that a woman don't need to be equal to a man. They don't need to vote. They don't need to run for public office. I say to you, sir, if you've got a whole gallon and I've got just a little old pint, isn't it just plain old mean to deny me my little portion full? Oh, and someone said, I forgot who did. Say that a woman is weak. Oh, sir. <laughs> There's no such thing as a weak woman. They said a woman is weak and they need to be taken care of and given the best of places. No one ever helped me over mud puddles and into carriages and gave me the best of places. And ain't I a woman? Ain't I a woman? Look at me. I'm tall and strong. In my younger days, I had big arms and muscles. I could outwork any man in this here place. And no man could help me. And ain't I a woman? Ain't I still a woman? 
Now the women folk are asking, you better let them have it because you can't stop it. It's coming. So now, might not happen today, but in the future, there are going to be a time that women folk can speak out in public without being ridiculed. They'll be able to run for public office and vote and be able to own their own property and work outside the house. Oh, it's coming. You can't stop it. So between us women folk in the north and my sisters down in the south, you men folk are going to find yourself right in the middle. And that's not a very good place to be. Now, I thank you all kindly for letting me speak at this here convention. I didn't really have no speech prepared, but I had to get something off my chest. So also, Journey ain't got nothing more to say. I thank you all kindly. Miss Truth, or do you prefer Mrs. or Sojourner? Sojourner. Um, Sojourner. Um, it is interesting you bring up Eve. I've brought up Eve too in my life. Remember when she was tempted by the serpent in the Garden of Eden? She was not tempted with pretty jewelry or dresses or finery. She was tempted with knowledge. So I've always thought perhaps her days spent with Adam picking flowers and engaging in casual conversation might not have been enough for her feminine sensibilities. It was the, the idea that there was more to learn that was her draw away from Eden. <laughs> yes, I quite agree, quite agree. I think I might write a book on the subject. Good idea, <laughs> good idea. Our movement, Ms. Sojourner, it was indeed early on faced with so many challenges and schisms and I do apologize that you were treated with question for wanting to speak. Fortunately, Ms. Mrs. Gage, the leader of the 18 and 51 Akron Convention did indeed say, no, let her speak. And I am grateful she did. The goals between abolition and women's suffrage and civil rights for Americans who had been discouraged and disenfranchised for so long were communal goals. The Civil War would be fought and the 13th Amendment would be passed, finally ending slavery in the North and, and the South and indeed the entire country. But that would not give women any kind of a security in our suffrage. Ah, the 14th Amendment, though, to the Constitution would be passed with its debatable language. Really, a literal reading of the thing indicated that the states would only be penalized through representative numbers if they denied the vote to any male of voting age. The idea was if the states, particularly the southern ones, denied black men of voting age the right to vote, then they would be penalized in representation. But nowhere in that 14th Amendment did it state that women couldn't vote. And then many of us thought the 15th Amendment was quite clear. If I may, uh, Mrs. Stanton, uh, the right of citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Exactly. The 15th Amendment, nowhere does it state anything about sex. Miss Anthony, myself, and other suffragists would even cast, or, well, try to cast, ballots with that amendment in mind. And still the issue was debated and states assumed the powers of determining their voting qualifications, almost invariably, with the exception of some of the newer Western states, denying the elective franchise to tax-paying, property-holding American women. I would be an old, old lady when the brilliant career of Alice Paul was just beginning. And we knew an amendment for equal rights, one that superseded the states was necessary, but I wouldn't see it in my lifetime. Miss Paul, I thank you for your dedication to the cause. Please tell us more. Stanton, you've been an inspiration to me. And of course, you, Sojourner, have been an inspiration as well to everyone in my generation who has worked for equality. I went to England to
to study in Birmingham, England, a dirty industrial city, but I bicycled to hear Christabel Pankhurst speak about votes for women. Well, she tried to speak, but she was heckled off the platform. Still, I had met my first suffragette and I began to work for the suffrage movement in England, but I was not prepared as a shy Quaker woman for the violence that I encountered. I started out by selling, that's right, selling like a, a news vendor, a newspaper called Votes for Women. And then I began to rouse crowds to try to get people to gather when there was a convention or a political meeting of men now, at that time, no women were allowed at political gatherings in England, none at all. Why, you ask? For fear that one might be a suffragette and one might approach the politician and confront him with his position on votes for women. So we had to think of very clever ways to get into the halls. We came in as charwomen. I decided once I would try to come down a chimney we tried everything we could to draw attention to our cause, but we were always attacked. We, we rolled bats of cotton underneath our clothes so that when the police whacked us with their truncheons, we would be less harmed. Well, when I was in England, I was put in prison seven times and the conditions I felt there were terrible and they caused me to become very ill, leave England before I intended to and come back to the United States. But once back in the United States, I earned a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in economics and then decided I was strong enough to get back into the suffrage movement. And so I did. I approached the National Suffrage Association and asked if I could lead the fight for a federal amendment. They said, yes, but you must raise every penny you need all by yourself. So I moved down to Washington, DC. Now, at that time, nine states all in the West already had suffrage for women. Women could vote there. And the National Association was bent on going state by state by state and asking each state to put suffrage in their constitution. Well, that was wasted effort. We can't go begging men in every state. No, we must have a federal amendment. That way all the states must obey. So I went down to Washington with the idea that we could hold a big procession of women right on the eve of Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. He was being inaugurated on March 4th, 1913. So we put on our best clothing, our best white dresses, and we wore sashes of purple, gold, and white, and we marched instead. And we had people from all over the, the country, women, yes, and men too, but it turned very ugly. The crowds were so close that we could no longer march. They heckled us. They beat us with our banners. Many women were severely injured, but troops were brought in from Fort Myer and then we were able to continue our parade. It's said that when Woodrow Wilson came for his inauguration to Union Station, he said, where is everyone? Why, watching the women's procession on Pennsylvania Avenue, he was told. <laughs> well, I thought the parade was a success, but the National Association asked me to step down. They said I was too militant. No, no, I told them I'm a shy Quaker woman. But then we decided to picket the White House. Why? Because Woodrow Wilson refused to see us. Mrs. Stanton, your daughter, Harriet Stanton Blatch joined us with a sign that said, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? We kept watch fires burning day and night and we burned Wilson's speeches against about democracy. <laughs> yes, well, that turned ugly too. We were beaten with our own banners. We were arrested, of course, 
not the ones who beat us. And we were taken to prison. Do, do you know Occoquan prison? It's filthy. The food was filled with worms. Well, that made it easy to go on hunger strike. So we stopped eating. And then here in the United States, again, we were terribly, terribly mistreated. But eventually the war in Europe ended, 1918 came and Woodrow Wilson finally agreed that women should have the vote. He finally jumped on the bandwagon. Then on May 2nd, 1919, the House of Representatives voted and the House passes the vote. But what about the Senate? What about the Senate? It doesn't look good. But on May 4th, the Senate passes the amendment by one vote. Now don't go looking jubilant, anyone, because if we are to vote in the next election, ladies, we must have ratification by three quarters of the states. Yes. Well, I wish you could have seen the tricks that were used to try to stop us. For example, in Tennessee, the liquor lobby put it around that women were responsible for prohibition. They kept free liquor flowing day and night to the male legislators. But on August 18, 19 and 20, Tennessee ratified by one vote. And in 1920, the women went to the polls and voted for the very first time. Now, you know, with the women movement and the passing of the laws and the amendment, and we got the right to vote, that was like for people of color one step. Now, in some states, of course, refused to believe the amendment and still denied us the right to vote. So we knew we had a lot of work to do. So we had two things, not only the right to vote, but we wanted some kind of amendment and just some kind of law to just say that we are, we are citizens, that we are human, that we can have the same rights as everybody else. So with the women's <clears throat> movement to have the vote and pass, that was just one small step for us, people of color. So our journey had just begun and we were fighting then up until way up in the future, I think we'll still be fighting for the same thing. But we had a good foundation with the women's suffrage movement, that was a good foundation. And that spurred us off to fight for freedom and equality for everyone. So that's what I want for my sisters to do in the future, to keep things stirring, to not to let things keep stagnant, to keep things moving, speak up and go to meetings just like I did, invite it or not, just show up to find out what's going on. And I want everybody to work together, just like the fingers on the hand, to work together to get things done, all races. Now the fingers on the hand work pretty good, but when you put them all together in a fist, oh, it delivers quite a blow. So that's what I want the people to do, especially my sisters of all races in the future to do, because this is a struggle. Well, I can see it's not gonna stop here. It's gonna go way on into the future. So Turner, I do agree that giving the getting the vote only gave us equality in voting and not in any other sphere of life. Uh, it, it, you know, my father actually was a farmer and also president of the bank, but he always said, once you put your hand to the plow, you don't take it off till you get to the end of the row. And even after we got the vote, and this goes to your point, I knew that we were not at the end of our row. And that's why I authored an amendment, a constitutional amendment to the United States Constitution. Now it, it has not passed, but it is there. The idea of there is there. The idea of equality as a guiding principle in our constitution that men and women are equal. I hope one day it will pass. I hope everyone will do their part to see that equality 
is a worthwhile endeavor for us all. Yes, I quite agree. Thank it you so much. Ms. Stanton, that... final thoughts from you, please. Oh, well, it, it does seem to me that um, we've had these laws, the, the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment. They give American citizenry its definition and its responsibilities and its abilities. It seems though as if the executives and the men, dare I say, in charge of various states and uh, communities were the ones that were um, contriving things to their own benefit to not let women and Negroes have the rights of the American citizenry, rights to which we are born. I, I do believe the best is yet to be. Uh, the strongest reason why I, we all, continue to ask for a woman's voice in the government under which she lives, in the religion in which she is asked to believe, in equality, in the social life where she is the chief factor, a place in the trades and professions where she may earn her bread, is because of her birthright to self-sovereignty. Because as an individual, she must ultimately rely on herself who I ask can dare take on the rights and, uh, and the responsibilities and duties of another human soul. No one, we are responsible for our own souls alone in the end when we go to our maker. We go alone to our final reward. And I aim to have done all I could for my community. And that to me means ensuring fair treatment for all under the law. Thank you so much. This has been an absolute education uh, for, for me and I'm sure for our audience as well. So we are going to open up the floor for questions and answers. I'm going to lead with a question for you, Sojourner Truth, that came from our audience. Uh, one, do you know if anyone uh, recorded or transcribed your speech and why did you choose the name Sojourner for yourself? Well, for my speech, a lot of folks uh, wrote it down different ways. So you can argue about that quite a bit. But um, being at that convention, I didn't intend to make no speech. I just spoke from the heart. When I got up there, responded to the things the men said. So a lot of folks wrote it down differently, different books and such. But I said, ain't I a woman? Ain't I a woman? And my name, Sojourner, remember when I was free in uh, New York, I was living at the time, God gave me a message that says, he want me to walk up and down the countryside like the people in the Bible. The people in the Bible sojourn the valleys and the hill. So I said, they, they sojourn the valley and the hills. I'm going to get ready to do the same thing. So I named myself Sojourner. And then wherever I go, I'll speak the truth from my heart. So truth shall be my last name. So that's how I name myself, Sojourner Truth. Well, Miss Anthony and I have been publishing um, a, a history of women's suffrage in America. And Miss Sojourner Truth's speech is one cited in that book, we, we took one of the articles that we believed was most faithful to its transcription and included it in our publication. Excellent. A second question we got from our uh, audience this morning is, why do you believe that women weren't allowed to vote? Oh, I, I, I suppose I could go first. Um, why do I believe, I, I don't believe women weren't allowed to vote. I believe we had the rights of voters and I even tried to vote actually when I, I owned my home. It was in my name actually, not even in my husband's name in Tanafly, New Jersey, I paid taxes on it. I went down to the public um, uh, bureau to vote on election day. And uh, well, the fellow there said, oh, women aren't allowed to vote. I said, yes, in the constitution, women, there's nothing saying that there's nothing preventing me. He says, well, I haven't read the constitution. Well, I think therein lies a lot of our problem. Ignorance of our laws and on the part of those who would profess to 
enact those laws. Again, the folks in the executive, the folks who are responsible for carrying out the laws. Legislators can make them, but the executives have to actually um, make sure that they're upheld. So when that man told me he hadn't read the constitution, it firmly planted in my mind that, well, one of us has a responsibility in their right to vote and in their ability to vote. One of us has actually read the legislation of our country. That would be me. If anybody in our two person conversation here did not have the responsibility or the right to vote as far as I was concerned, it was the fellow who never read our laws. You know, you've hit on a very strong point, Mrs. Stanton. The truth is that every generation of persons who is born must be educated and they must learn, yes, the laws, but they must also have their minds opened. Now, I always say that it's not whether you're born male or female, because remember, we had a great many men who were on our side in the suffrage and the equality movement, not just women. And in fact, a lot of the women were against suffrage. They were afraid of it. They needed educating. And I think the reason we finally did get the vote was because of all of the work that you and Susan B. Anthony and Sojourner and all of the women who went before in the century or more of struggle had educated, educated publicly despite all odds. And eventually we were able to win the vote because of that. And two now, now my situation is totally different here. Now you think about the time, look at my skin. Back then voting, and of course the white men ruled everything. So they didn't even have in mind counting us as a person back then. I wasn't even considered a person. And most of the times we were slaves. So they didn't even think about us voting or even us as a person back then. So we had to scrape and scrape and scrape to try to even get to the women's suffrage movement. So that's why we couldn't vote. Voting wasn't even considered for people like me, it wasn't even considered. So again, as I said before, the women's rights movement, the suffrage movement started the whole thing, opened the eyes of those who eyes were closed before, those who wrote the constitution, those who wrote the constitution, eyes had to be open to the fact that we are citizens. We have the rights, just like everyone else, to vote and to run for public office. But that wasn't even in the mind thinking back then, the mindset. Well, indeed, it was. It became a great controversy after the Civil War, uh, after the uh, 13th Amendment in, in the 14th and 15th Amendments. You can see the wording of them and how they were specifically <laughs> jumping through hoops to try to figure out how we could or could not be inclusive and yet still be in understanding of citizenship. It was a great question. Yeah. Um, before I move on to the next question, I want to make sure I bring in our second poll because it also kind of ties into the next question uh, with Ms. Paul. Uh, what percentage of states need to ratify or approve an amendment to the Constitution before it becomes law? Is it 25%, 51%, 75%, or 100%? And while our audience answers that question, uh, a question came in for Ms. Paul. You mentioned that when you marched, you wore white and a sash of purple, gold, and white. What, what do those colors represent, and why did you choose them? You know, so many people are interested in, in why these colors were chosen. And it's for a very simple reason. And that is when you have a glorious cause to show to the world, as we did in suffrage and the vote, you want to put your best foot forward. You want to wear your best clothes and you want to have something that looks beautiful. There was a, a pageant uh, organizer whose name was Hazel McKay, 
And she said, we need some very pretty colors to set us apart and to brand us as suffragists. And she developed the stripes of purple, gold, and white. And so you see, it was, a, it was an effort to look as good as we could and to say to the world, this is a noble cause. You see how we respect the cause by dressing as well as we can. Thank you. Do we have the results of the poll? I think is I think our poll's closed. And do we have the results of that? And 53% of our audience correctly said that it is 75%. So uh, they are not ignorant of the law. They are paying attention, which is great. Um, another question came in from our audience uh, about westward expansion and the independent and strong nature of women who traveled westward. Do you think that helped make the Western states more open towards women's suffrage? Yes, certainly. Well, you know, um, this, this is what happens when men are sent out to farm or, or pen for gold or to build the West. The men go out and uh, pretty soon they realize there are no women. And so they sent for the women. And one of the ways that they could entice women out there into those horrible, barren, wild lands was to say, we will give you the vote if you come. You will have some rights if you come. And that's why the Western states were successful in getting women out there to marry the men and to make a civilized uh, country out of the wild, wild west. And think of the mind of, of the women who would indeed leave everything comfortable behind, everything they knew, their family and their home in the East to travel someplace unknown to travel. They were pioneers and indeed they were free thinkers who would be willing to make that journey and able to make that journey. And part of the promise was also property rights. And also too, a lot of the um, the people of color, after uh, they were freed, they wanted to go west, big expansion to build and start new towns and homes. Um, I remember one time I went to Kansas and I've been to uh, Nevada, so I travel all those places there. At one time I went back to the White House and talked to President Ulysses Grant to ask him for land grants because I want us to have some big old open space so that we can start our town or, or our own town and start our own uh, building and share it with one another. So that westward expansion was a good thing. And a lot of people went out there, as Ms. Stanton mentioned, for adventure and to start a new thing. Mr. Staten, if you don't mind my jumping in, I, I you are the historian or the or the best uh, historian I think among us. Was it not Alex de Tocqueville from France who wrote about how quickly the Americans moved to conquer a continent and move west, and yet it was the woman that brought the stabilizing force of the country, and indeed slowed the men so that towns and civilization, as Ms. Stanton pointed out, actually did take root and sort of mellowed out and, and allowed us to stabilize and, and, and create the, uh, the rest of the country, as it were. Am I, am I not correct in that? I believe you are correct, sir. I mean, the, the story of the United States, one of the stories of the United States is how rapidly we expanded uh, westward so yes, I, I believe he did mention and write about that. May I add something? And Mr. Toc de Tocqueville was part of this too. Uh, the Harvey Company and the railroads and the civilizing of the wild, wild west. Indeed, many of the restaurants along the railroad lines during my time, and I would travel those railroad lines initially, were all staffed by men and they would get into fights. And indeed, a lot of the fights were over color and about black rights. Eventually, Mr. Harvey, a Scottish man who ended up uh, having a lot of these restaurants out west in the 1870s, he determined that by putting waitresses, young women in these western outposts, 
good women of character from back east, that they would quite literally civilize the Wild West. And they did. They settled out there and became some of our most stalwart American citizens in those parts of the country. And, and when you say civilize the Wild West, you mean civilize the men who needed some polishing around the rough edges. <laughs> Absolutely. They took the men by the ears, sat them down and gave them good food. <laughs> and also taught them very valuable lessons in life. And I think well, men, probably made them stronger for it. Men were much more likely to be rowdy in the company of other men, but around dignified, intelligent women, they actually would behave like gentlemen. Well, uh, I, as much as I hate to say it, we have reached five o'clock PM and this has been remarkable. I do want to say though, Miss Stanton, Miss Paul and Miss Truth, uh, I'm sure that you know that we now have a woman vice president for the first time in our nation's history. Uh, I am sure that in a matter of years, we will have our first female president in, in, uh, in our nation's history. And, um, and uh, it will be uh, probably sooner than we all think. That said, I want to thank the three of you uh, for the wonderful stories, the wonderful lessons that you have taught us today. Uh, your knowledge and fight and determination is a wonderful lesson to us all. Uh, Mr. Staten, to you, sir, as always, thank you for your uh, abilities. To all of those out there who have joined us, uh, especially the classes, the teachers who have brought their classes on to, uh, to learn all of these phenomenal lessons today. I do want to quickly remind you again about our Master Teacher Recognition Program, as well as uh, Toward a More Perfect Union, our Student Essay Challenge. The deadline is March 30th. And on behalf of, again, our supporter, the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, and all of us at the Center for Education Reform. We wish you all a wonderful evening and hope to see you again in the very near future. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.